So you all are a generous group, and if, if you're here this morning and maybe you're skeptical about churches talking about the topic of money, again, this is not because we need it. You all are very generous, but we're talking about this because generosity is one of God's ways. And again, our mission as a church is to invite people to discover and experience God's ways, and your generosity makes that possible. So I want to start with a question for you, and the question is this, have you ever been dehydrated? Have you ever been dehydrated? And, and there's a difference between being thirsty and being dehydrated, right? Being thirsty is this feeling or this sensation of like, man, I, I, I need a drink of water. But being dehydrated is very different. It's this physiological response that your body has because you don't have enough liquid inside of your body. So have you, not have you ever been thirsty, but have you ever really been dehydrated? And as I think about my own life, there are two times that uh, immediately come to mind for me. The first time that I was really dehydrated, I was dealing with an intestinal illness. And after several hours, my wife said, man, we probably need to take you to the emergency room. And apparently, I didn't know this, they can take your blood pressure when you're sitting and then when you're standing and somehow the difference shows how dehydrated you are and they said yeah you're dehydrated so uh, they put me in a bed and hooked me up to you know two tanks and I was just was getting a fill up there and I man I started to feel really good really quickly and uh, but the second time that I was really dehydrated it was really worse than that and I wish that I could have been hooked up to uh, two tanks and, but that just was not possible because this second time I was in the jungles of Guatemala. I, I was there on a, on a mission trip. We were in the jungles. We were working with uh, some of the local pastors, reaching out to the Ketchi people who live there in the jungles. And we trekked 20 miles in two days. And unfortunately, at the beginning of our second day, the, uh, we were not able to replenish our water supply. And if, if you know anything about the jungles of Guatemala, water, good, clean drinking water, uh, good water that you can then filter is sort of in short supply. And we were unable to fill up that morning. So as we were going along, we ran out of water and it was hot and I started getting dehydrated. And I'm also dealing with heat exhaustion. And, and we're probably at this point... Uh, in the last five miles, but I have no idea how much further that we have to go. And it was through this experience that I, that the true to real moment for me was that verse about pray without ceasing because God, please help me to take a step and another one and another one and so on and so forth. But we get to this point, we're walking along and, and off to the side of the trail, there's a hut. And this hut is probably 150 yards away and somebody from the hut, you know, kind of runs down and, and says, hey, w will you come up and pray for one of our relatives? We have a relative in here who needs prayer. And I'm going to just say, I, this was not my proudest moment, because here we're on this mission trip. We're, we're there to do ministry to the catchy people, to encourage them. And what was going on in my mind at that moment, as I looked at this hut, I'm like, that's 150 yards there, 150 yards back. I don't know how much longer we have to go. That puts me about 300 yards down the trail. And can I use the energy to get there and back that could get me closer to the end of this thing? So I want to pause the story right there for a few minutes. And you may be wondering, what's the point, Matt? Why are you asking us about being dehydrated? Why are you telling us this story? And, and the point is this, is I think that often when it comes to this topic of giving and finances and generosity, we approach it a lot like a dehydrated person. That, that we just feel like everything is dried up within us and we just have nothing left to give to anyone. And it doesn't help that we're constantly asked for money, right? I mean, wherever you go, it feels like you're being bombarded and you're being asked for money. So maybe you have, you have faced this dilemma. Have you ever gone to a restaurant? And I'm talking about one of those restaurants where you walk up, you order your food, 
And, uh, and then you're gonna, they're going to give you a buzzer or they're, somehow they're going to let you know when your food's ready. And then you're going to walk up and pick up your food and you're going to bring it back to the table. And then when you're all done, you're going to take your food and you're going to take it and you're going to put the trash in the trash can. You're going to put the plate on the thing. You know what I'm talking about? And then you finish your order and on that little thing that comes up, it says, would you like to tip? I mean, you ever get, get real here? You ever thought for what? I appreciate the people that are making my food in the back, but what, who am I tipping? Tip myself because I'm going to do all the work, right? Or maybe you've gone to the grocery store, you get your stuff, and, and then you get to the checkout line, and they ask you that question, right? They say, do you want to round up to save the children's lives? No, I'm a horrible person. I don't want to save any children today. But then you remember, oh no, I'm wearing my Hope Church t-shirt right now. I'll never do that again when I go to the store, but yes, all right, I'll save the children today, right? Or maybe, maybe it's not even money. Maybe you have a friend and your friend says, I need to talk. Do you have a couple minutes? And, and you know, you, I, it's not going to be a couple minutes. <laughs> it's going to be more than a couple of minutes. Or depending on the neighborhood that you live in, as Brian reminded us earlier, someone just like this little girl is going to show up at your door with her basket stretched out, wanting you to give her something, right? So we're constantly being asked to give all the time, and we're being asked to give of our resources, and resources are time, money, energy, maybe candy, whatever it is. We're being asked to give, and, and a lot of the things that we're being asked to give to are good causes. I mean, the candy helps keep the dentist in business, right? So, I mean, we're, a lot of the stuff that we're being asked to give to, they are good causes, but we, we approach this topic like someone who is dehydrated, like we're just shriveled up. We have nothing to give. So before we go further in this series, this week, what I want to do is I want us to look at the source of generosity. Where does it all come from? Because because I think one of our biggest problems in life as we go about life is that we just we feel like we don't have anything to give. We feel it because we feel dehydrated. And, and it maybe it's not because we don't actually have anything to give, but we feel like we don't have anything to give because of the source that we're trying to give from. We're looking within ourselves. And even though we feel like we have nothing to give, the, the truth is, the reality is, is that when you make a decision to follow Jesus, when you decide to follow him, to make him the director of your life, what you've actually done is you have tapped in to this well of living water that doesn't run dry. That's what we have as followers of Christ. And in fact, this, this well that doesn't run dry is so much deeper than we can even imagine. It's filled with life and energy and vitality. And then as you learn to walk with Jesus over time, and it's a journey, wherever you're at in your journey right now, you will spend the rest of your life on this journey, learning more and more and more. And you start to understand this topic of generosity. And you start to understand that what, what God has given you what flows from God to you, he's given it to you so that it can flow from you to others. And you can actually do it with joy in your heart. And, and you, you understand that as you're filled with God's goodness and God's generosity, he gives to us so that we can give to others. And, and I believe that, that as individuals and as a church, that, 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 that as we give, we can be a part of seeing lives change. In fact, as you are giving, you are being a part of seeing lives changed. And, and just this week, I was so excited to, to get word that, that one of you uh, had been reaching out to someone in your life that, that, that is important to you. And, and, and the gospel was shared this week, and a life was changed forever because someone decided to follow Jesus. Someone new who has not had access to this, this well of living water, now has access to it. 
and their life will be different. So I want us to focus today on the source because it's what we focus on makes all the difference. And I want us to focus on God today. So the first point in your handout is this, is that God is the first and the most generous of all givers. He's the first and he's the most generous. Think about that for just a minute. There would be no giving without God. There would be no generosity without God. God's the one who initiated giving. God's the one who initiated generosity. In fact, anything connected to giving and generosity that we experience is actually finds its root and its source in God. Let's look at James 117. Every good gift and every perfect present comes from heaven. It comes down from God. Why do we even have generosity and giving in this world? Because God's the one that decided it should be here. You ever heard of Giving Tuesday? It's, I find it fascinating that Giving Tuesday comes after Black Friday and after Cyber Monday. So after we've spent all the money that we have, and in some cases spend more money than we have, then if there's anything left over, we do Giving Tuesday. And I'm not saying Giving Tuesday is a bad thing. In fact, this is a website all about it. And it says Giving Tuesday is a global generosity movement, unleashing the power of radical generosity. That's a good thing. Giving Tuesday was created in 2012 as a simple idea. A day that encourages people to do good. God bless Giving Tuesday. God bless all the people that are giving on Giving Tuesday. But we wouldn't have a Giving Tuesday if God wasn't the first and the most generous of all givers. Throughout the year, Forbes does all kinds of different lists. I find their list fascinating. And, and from time to time, I think there's some really good things to think about. And this list I found earlier this summer is America's 25 most generous givers. All right, so number one on the list here, Mr. Warren Buffett, lifetime giving. Look at that number, $42.8 billion. $42.8 billion Warren Buffett has given to all kinds of things. How much money do you have to make to give $42.8 billion, right? I'm sure a lot of good has been done with the money, with the $42.8 billion that he has given. Number six on the list caught my attention. Number six is Mackenzie Scott. Now, if you're not sure who Mackenzie Scott is, she's new to the area of philanthropy. She's new after she got divorced from Amazon's Jeff Bezos. She's new, they got divorced in 2019. So look at this. Lifetime giving of $5.83 billion since 2019. She's only been in this game for a few years. She's already number six on the list. And she's doing a great job putting Jeff Bezos' money to good use, right? Now, if you look at the full list of all the top 25, over a lifetime, they have collectively given nearly $150 billion dollars. I mean, that, that number is not even comprehensible to most of us. $150 billion. But as, as incomprehensible or as inconceivable, right, as, as one could say $150 billion is, God's generosity to us is infinitely more inconceivable than that. So again, I want to take the focus off of us and what our part is. And let's just look at God. Let's look at his generosity. He's the first and he's the most generous giver. And let's look at some specific ways that he is. First, he is the generous creator. God is the generous creator. You look, the very first book of the Bible, the very first chapter, the first four verses say this, in the beginning, God created. We would not have unless God created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. 
and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Now stop just for a moment and think about what would this world be like if there was no light? We'd be bumping around into things, right? We wouldn't be able to see. And the kind of light that God provides, the natural light from outside, not only does it provide a way for us to see, it provides warmth. God is the first and the most generous of all givers, and he's the generous creator. And just to help us understand a little bit of God's generosity and creation, let's take a look at Psalm 104. Psalm 104, it's about 35 verses. I didn't invite you to read it on your own, but here's a couple of parts of it. It starts out and says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. O Lord my God, how great you are. You are robed with honor and majesty. And then verse 10, it says, You make springs pour water into the ravine so that the strings gush down from the mountains. They provide water for all the animals. And the wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds nest beside the streams and sing among the branches of the trees. So there's this picture and this imagery that God's providing the water for the animals to drink. And then we go a little bit further, verse 24. Oh, Lord, what a variety of the things you have made. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here's the ocean, vast and wide, teeming with life of every kind, both large and small. And if you stop and think about it for just a minute, the vast majority, and I mean the vast majority, of God's creation, one, will never be seen by you or I, but really, it will never be seen by any human eyes. God is the generous creator. Here's a couple of quick examples. Take a look at these. Now, if you're my son who loves bugs, he's four years old, you get really excited about this. Did you know that God created 350,000 species of beetles? Not 350,000 beetles, 350,000 species of beetles. Now, if I was God and I was going to create beetles, I mean, how many species of beetles do you need, right? I might create one or two species. Because again, we're not talking about all the beetles within that species. We're talking about species here. And if I was really feeling generous, maybe five species. But God in his generosity created 350,000 species of beetles. Here's this next one. This is a nudibranch. It's a tiny sea slug that lives on the ocean floor. There are 3,000 species of these. Now, unless you're sitting here right now looking at this picture, or you're an avid reader of National Geography, or National Geographic magazine, or you happen to be like a deep sea diver, oceanographer person, you're never going to see one of these. In fact, you didn't even know these things existed on the ocean floors. And there's 3,000 species of these. Here's another thing. This is a diatom. It's a microscopic algae. We cannot see these with our eyes. You need a microscope to see them. There's somewhere between 20,000 and 2 million species of these. 20,000 to 2 million. And then here's one more picture for you. God created this universe. He created everything in it. He created all the stars. And, you know, most of us live in the city. And there's a, 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 maybe a clear night with not a very bright moon. And you can look up and you see a couple of stars and you're like, wow. Then maybe you're on a road trip driving somewhere desolate in the middle of the night or you're camping and you look up and you're like, Wow. But even again, we're not going to see most of what God has created off of this planet, in the skies, in the heavens. Now, with the money he has left, Jeff Bezos is trying to help you get closer to that, right? But again, the vast majority of, of what God has created 
we're never going to see it. We're never going to experience. But that's how generous of a God he is. He's a generous creator. Another thing is he provides relationships and community. I mean, we've already considered 350,000 species of beetles. That's a lot of beetle community, right? So God created community among the animals and the insects and the other things that he created. But God, in chapter 2, we, we learn that God formed the first human. He formed this man, Adam, and he breathed life into his nostrils, We are here on this planet because God made us. And then after God made man, we find this. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper fit for him. So out of the man, Adam, God created Eve. And this is the beginning of community. This is the beginning of relationships. This is a very specific, a very special, unique relationship. The relationship between a man and a woman, this was the first marriage. And it's through this relationship that God in his generosity gave the ability to procreate so that families could be started. And from families, there would be the beginnings of communities. And from communities, there would be societies and cultures. And eventually the world would be populated. We're rapidly approaching 8 billion people. And it all started with these two, God created them, created them to love them and have a relationship with them. We have community today. Hope Church is a type of community because of God's generosity. He also meets our needs. God is the one who ultimately meets our needs. And whether we realize it or not in the moment, every need that you have that's being met comes from God. Well, yeah, but I have a job, and I work, and I do. Who's giving you the breath in your lungs right now? If you have asthma, you've had some type of respiratory distress, you know how precious it is to have breath in your lungs. Air is just one of those basic needs, right? We need air, we need water, we need food. God's the one that meets those needs. Now, our problem is, though, we often confuse needs and wants, right? There are certain things that we need. I mean, if we don't drink enough water, we become dehydrated, and then bad things can happen. But there are certain things we want, and they're not necessarily bad things. But if God doesn't give you everything you want... It doesn't mean that he's not meeting your needs. It doesn't mean that he's not being generous. So let's go back to the jungles in Guatemala. I'm so glad I was there with a group because a person came down and said, come pray, and they just started going. I kind of didn't have a choice at that point, so I just started going. God, help me to take these steps and get up to this hut. And we go into the hut, and uh, we pray. And then the, the, the local pastors there, they stayed in the hut and they were talking and, and, and having a, a, an extended conversation with the family. And, and those of us uh, who, who came down, uh, we, we went outside of the hut and we were just sort of sitting there. And then out of their gratitude for us coming, I don't get a lot of visitors from the U.S. at that part of the jungle. Out of, out of our gratitude for coming there and the work that we were doing, and specifically out of gratitude for coming and praying for this relative, one of the family members walks up to us with this big basket. And then they lower the basket down, and inside this basket, there were the most wonderful, most amazing, best-tasting oranges I had ever had in my life. Now, already we had experienced fresh off the, 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 the vine or off the tree, bananas. But bananas don't quite meet the same need that oranges do. And in that moment when we had no water left and we were thirsty, we were dehydrated, God provided for our needs through these oranges. And not only was there 
liquid in the oranges and the juiciness. There was a little bit of sugar in there, right? And, 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 and as we ate those oranges, we started to pick back up. And I don't know how much longer we have to go, but we might be able to make it now. And here I am today, so I made it. I survived. God met me there in that moment. He met my real physical needs. He provided for them. But here's the thing. Not only does God meet our real physical needs, God actually meets our greatest need. Our greatest need is not a physical need. It's a spiritual need. And God meets that need. In fact, we saw in Genesis chapter 2, God created humans. The very next chapter, we screw it all up. We do the one thing that he says not to do, and that first man, Adam, he acted on behalf of all humanity. When he rebelled against God, we fell into this fallen state, sin entered this world, and from that moment forward to this moment that you and I are living in, we live in a broken world. We feel the effects of sin. We know the effects of sin. And that's the state that we live in. Each and every one of us, on our own, in our own strength, in our own power, we're not good enough on our own to repair the broken relationship with God. But God, out of His generosity, He sent His Son to rescue broken humanity. The one summary verse of the Bible is John 3.16. Listen to what it says. And don't miss this. This is such a a, a simple verse. We use it all the time. But it says, for God so loved the world, what? That he gave. This is the ultimate act of God's generosity. I wouldn't give my son for any of you. I like you. You're good people, some of you, most of you. But God gave his only son. Why? Why? God gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is how we know that God is a generous God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not from your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Again, you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. There's nothing that we can do on our own. We can't boast about how great we are. God, in His love and His kindness and His mercy and His generosity, He sent His Son to do what we could not do for ourselves. And then, look at Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So God sent his son to rescue broken humanity. He's the one who generously meets our greatest needs. And then finally, he is the source of every spiritual blessing. God himself is the source of every spiritual blessing. The Apostle Paul is a man who, he was radically opposed to Christians, to those that were following Jesus. In fact, he was on his way, on his way to Damascus. He was there to hunt them down and persecute them and arrest them. And on that road, he met Jesus. And Jesus changed him. Jesus transformed him. And he went from being hostile against members of the way, as it was called at that time, the followers of Jesus, to himself being one of the greatest proponents of the gospel. He traveled all throughout what's Europe and parts of Asia today, sharing the message of the gospel, sharing the life transformation that he experienced so that others could experience. He helped start all kinds of churches and train people and encourage people in these churches. And then to the church in Ephesus... He said this, he said, blessed be God, God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And what does that mean? What's a spiritual blessing? It's not some sort of like 
cosmic superpower or something like that. But what it's talking about, these are the key benefits for having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So here here they are. You can read the rest of the passages, but here they are in bullet form. One, God himself, out of his love and his generosity, he chose us. God chose us. Next, we're adopted into his family. It doesn't matter what kind of family you grew up in. It doesn't matter what kind of family you might be in right now. All the pain and the hurt because we live in a broken world. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been adopted into God's very own family. Next, the blood of Christ has taken away the guilt of our sins. We stand before the Father as perfectly accepted. What that means, when we stand in Christ, we stand here, and when God looks at us, He doesn't see us. He sees Jesus. That's what it means to stand in Christ. Next, the price for our sins, the payment to buy us out of eternal combination was fully paid by the blood of Christ. Next, in paying the ransom for our sins, the debt of sin was canceled and we were forgiven. Guys, this is one of the things right now that we're confused about in our country. If you follow Jesus, If you've decided to make him your savior and make him your Lord, you have been forgiven. Your debt has been paid. It's not Jesus plus whatever the world's talking about right now. It's been fully paid. The debt has been canceled. There's not something else we as Christians have to do to be made right. It's been fully paid as we're forgiven. And then finally... Access to wisdom and insight through the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have God's Spirit living within you. I heard someone say, would you rather walk with Jesus for three years? Walk beside Him, which would be an amazing experience. Or would you rather walk the rest of your life with God's Spirit within you? If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit within you. He's our helper. He's our comforter. He's he's the one that gives us the power and the strength. Those are the spiritual blessings that we have. So God, He is the first and He's the most generous of all givers. He is a generous creator. He provides relationships and community. He meets our needs. He meets our greatest need, our spiritual need. He sent his son Jesus to rescue broken humanity, and he's the source of every spiritual blessing. If we understand this, I mean really understand it on a practical level, on a spiritual level, I think there's one more question we have to ask, and that is, what should our response be to a generous God? How do we respond to all that he has done? And I think we find this simple answer in Psalm 107. It says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. How do we respond to a generous God? We praise Him and we thank Him. We praise Him and we thank Him. We praise Him for who He is and who is God. God is kind. He is loving. He is patient. And He is generous. We praise Him for who He is, and then we thank Him specifically for what He's done. How has He specifically been kind to you? How has He specifically been patient with you? How has He specifically been generous with you? So I'm going to invite the band to come back up. They're going to play a song for us. And while they play, I want you to just reflect on this simple question. How's God been generous with me? Specifically, how has God been generous with me? You've got some blanks there on your your note sheet. It says, ways God has been generous to me. Just think about all the ways that God has been generous with you. And as the band plays, and as God brings some things to mind, just, just jot them down. And then I'll be back up in a couple of minutes to close us in prayer. So give thanks to the Lord because His steadfast love endures forever. I think one of the challenges that we have is that 
we often look at whatever our present circumstances are, and we use that to be a measure and a gauge of God's love, of God's faithfulness, and of God's generosity. But that's just not the case. God is the first and the most generous giver of all. He's been generous with creation. 350,000 species of beetles. he's, He's generous in giving us relationships, giving us community, giving us each other this community. And I think if anything, the last year and a half, almost approaching two years, have taught us is the value of community and having others in our lives. He meets our needs. He meets our deepest spiritual need. God is so generous with us. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we do thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your generosity. May we be remembered, be reminded of just how generous you are. May we never judge who you are based on the present circumstances we find ourselves in in the moment, in this broken world. You created a perfect world. But right now we live in a broken world because of sin. Thank you that we can have life, that we can have it abundantly through Jesus Christ. Father, show us how we can be generous with others as you have been so generous with us. Show us, give us opportunity, and then please give us the courage to take that step. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.